Two weeks remain of Worlds 2019 in Europe, and from now on is do or die as the teams hit the rift for the quarterfinals. We'll be going against the triple world champions, probably the most famous team in the world. I'm playing as Faker, he's basically the face of League of Legends. He was my idol, so beating them would mean so much. Our team has a very strong performance in the world. I think a lot of our teams will be able to get a lot of pride. Four on one. Fake is not flash available. He dashes. He doesn't even use the flash. That was Faker doing Faker things. You knew even before rolls, as could be as Faker. You knew he's gonna perform. You know Rook is gonna perform. We are champions right now. We just know that the teams who have experience and who have shown historically that they can do it time and time again, they are the ones to be scared of. more experienced players, or for someone like Faker, it's just another day at the job. It's either you win the entire thing, or it doesn't matter how far you went. And I think that's why, in the end, one of us will succeed. final del mundial bienvenidos a los cuartos de final 16 equipos han estado peleando para llegar hasta aquí tan solo 8 han conseguido llegar y solo 4 estarán la semana que viene aquí en madrid en vista alegre tenemos ya a los dos primeros equipos muchas gracias amigos esto no está subtitulado en el stream de riot muchas gracias lo siento por el jefe de riot no está subtitulado no te preocupes está todo bien Tenemos ya a los dos primeros equipos preparados. El primero es el campeón del mundo, es Invictus Gaming.
en la calle central, uno de los mejores jugadores del mundo. Ru, 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 ru. Cabo tirador, y aquí. Y como support, pa o lan. Como sustitutos, Duke Leyan y como entrenador, Mafa. Y enfrente tenemos al segundo seed coreano. Desde la LCK llega el equipo de Griffin. En la top lane. ¡Shoot! Como jungla. Tarzan. En la calle central. Cho. En la bot lane, Viper. Y como suplente, Legends. Como suplente, Doran. Y como entrenador, Caos. Todo preparado ya para que empiece este primer cuarto de final. Muchísimas gracias a toda la gente aquí en Madrid. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Empieza ya la fase final del Mundial. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Caster Desk. The World's Quarter Finals are beginning. You can hear that crowd in Spain. I am Freak. Jet and Papa Smith to my far right. How y'all doing? I'm pretty hyped, guys. We're here for quarterfinals. It feels like in some ways the tournament starts here when it comes to the meta. I think back to last year and what the quarterfinals meta ended up defining the entire thing. Are we going to see new stuff or is it going to be the same as groups? That's the interesting question. Yeah, and so much usually changes between groups and quarterfinals. So we know that based on what we saw from week two, yeah, Griffin looked incredible. Perhaps one of the best days of Worlds we've ever seen. Yep. But they're playing up against the former world champions who've been here before. They've been the number two seed out of their group before, literally last year, and still managed to make the run for the world final. So yep. even though we have some general ideas of what we think might happen, nothing is certain. Performance of the day, obviously incredibly important. That's one thing that really ties all these quarterfinals together is you can have your prediction and, and it can be well reasoned. But at the end of the day, especially with these two teams, there is so much variance in how well they will play on the day. And that's why the alignment of the predictions, kind of everyone thinking Griffin 3-1, largely among the casting team, is probably a surprise to most because at the end of the day, this is the team Griffin that people have heard of so much but haven't got to see unless you were watching LCK because actually winning those games that qualify you for major tournaments, they didn't even win one to make to this tournament. They came in as the second overall seed based on points. So yes, one day of four best of ones, mm -hmm. they looked honestly ungodly, unbelievable. And yet, in a best of five, can they recreate in this high pressure environment? And I think the wording that I settled on was if IG wins, it would be surprising, but not unexpected. Exactly. Because there is so much legacy and skill on both sides of the rift today. Yeah, overall, I think definitely people seem to align on Griffin probably being the better team. Their form seems to be higher. They've done 
they haven't achieved very much, unfortunately. They've got like an armload of silver medals from mostly winning the regular season in Korea for almost three splits in a row now, but but yet to show up on an international stage. And really. Just honestly, for me, you know, as the person who often has to speak about Griffin, it's almost like I'm telling riddles and myths about a team. <laughs> that when it comes to actually showing them on the world stage, either they're not there or they aren't the team mm -hmm. that I'm building them up for. And I'll say, their games, you know, on that day where they played four in a row, won all four of them, beat G2 twice, that was a Griffin I personally hadn't seen watching them domestically since early in spring when they were on a 11, 13 and 0 uh, best yeah. of three victory streak. So they really dialed back the clock for me, and that's with Sword back in the top lane as well. So it's just so hard to say for certain, just because they did it most recently, they'll do it again today. And that's where my eyes are going to be early, actually, is on Sword and on the Shy yeah. between IG. Because if there is a way that IG regains and holds their world championship form, I think a lot of it just comes down to solo lane destruction. And the Shy had some moments in group stage that made you remember the feared player that he was at the 2018 World Championship. But Sword also, even though, as far as I could tell, people were willing to write him off. There had been Doran throughout the summer split, Sword coming right back in for Worlds. But he ended up having some very big performances, and I can't wait to see those two match up as we're finally in picks and bans. Finally in the game one right now. Pantheon's still gonna be there as the first ban on the red side. And I'm just so curious which of these teams show up. We talked about, is it going to be the Griffin from LCK? Is it going to be the Griffin from Spring? That showed us so much. Invictus Gaming in Spring, they won. And last year, they won Worlds. In Summer, they were not that same team either. Uh, speaking of Griffin, they come in as the higher seed here, having won their group. So they have side selection in game one. They chose red side so far in group stages, undefeated on the red side as well, and it means the Shy less likely to get one of those big counter picks to really blow Sword out of the water. Interesting seeing this Jace ban here, though, as it's by far Sword's most played champion. Certainly yeah. a great the Shy staple as well, but you are hurting your own champ pool with this, and they're concerned huh. about the Sona bot lane. They're gonna get rid of it right off the bat. That's fascinating. The other bottom lane that they're keeping open, though, would be Garen Yumi. And when we were watching the Sona, Tom Kench versus Garen Yumi, Griffin versus Cloud9 game, I was fairly convinced that the Sona would technically be a counter to that. So that Sona ban actually, to me, says Griffin might be willing to go Garen Yumi in game one. And this is what kind of what I was thinking, because we talked about the top lane matchup, Rookie destroying the map. Not necessarily the 1v1. I think Chovy yeah. can match him 1v1. But roaming-wise, I definitely give the big advantage to Rookie as a player. Now, of course, could be a flex pick here with the Kiana. But regardless, they haven't shown any Yumi priority. The Kiana is a pick there that can get a sno top lane I think snowball going. going. Yumi. And there is the Yumi lock-in. So you know what? It's a pretty safe assumption. They right. were playing Ezreal Yumi last night in solo queue, and that's the other combo we've seen. So that's a possibility, but I think it's Garen Yumi. And in the LCK, we actually saw the most lane dominant Yumi play from Lucian Yumi as yeah. a duo. The Lucian priority been very down at Worlds recently, especially in the duo lane, but it's an outside possibility. Oh. It's a rollback of the Lulu. Yeah, and I think there's more to this Lulu pick than first meets the eye. Another thing that some teams have done against Garen Yumi, which now is confirmed as locked in, is picking more of a hyper carry bottom lane. So I can see them trying to pair up an Arden Sensor Lulu with either a Vayne or a Kogma or even a Twitch or something that can be very powerful later in the game. In Korea, Vayne was definitely seen as the answer there, and we saw it also played in the LEC. Hence the ban. So, of course, it's going to be the first ban coming out. The Kogma is one that's been on my lips because of the Kai'Sa matchup, yeah. and it's a champion that will be considered. I'd be over the moon for a Twitch, so who's to say we might not see a yeah. new AD carry choice here? But to be fair, if Kai'Sa is up, it's probably Kai'Sa with Lulu. But it's still interesting to see, right? Griffin are prioritizing what they are most afraid of above yeah. all other marksmen. Every single one not named in the game is no, no, no. Vayne is the number one scariest champ for us. We are removing that yes. from the table. Everything else is fine. The Kale needs to go away. That's a different soul laner here. IG have one final ban. And do remember, Jackie Love's trump card is Draven, and they are leaving yeah. that one open. It's a different style of champion from the vein when it comes to what it contributes against Draven, but it is notable that his ultra comfort is leave it left open. And this is also because the Gragas is locked in for Invictus Gaming, probably going to be a Kiana mid lane, since that's what we saw from Rookie in the group stage up yeah. against TL. And even though the LeBlanc is banned, it does leave Griffin open for potentially a last pick counter for mid lane. 
Okay, Griffin are going to leave mid up for last right here. Vladimir, the current hover for Sword. Most are looking around, though. Has yet to play Vladimir so far at Worlds. Going to play uh, Nar, which is, I would argue, yeah. a bit of a safer champion overall. I think the Shy is a stronger top laner, and playing something that's, I would argue, actually, Vlad can be exploitable in bad matchups, Nar less so. And no games played professionally for Sword on the Vlad. Probably one of the reasons they wanted to blood a top player like Doran was his more flexible champion pool. So given that, the Nar isn't a huge surprise. Here's that Cogmore hover. So maybe we're on to something here I with the thought. I was thinking that would be the one if it was not going to be the Vayne. So yeah, I there it is. This is the first Kogma of Worlds. We add another one to the roster. As Cog comes in, Cog Lulu definitely absurd damage. And he's not just a late game carry. This champ spikes on one item, spikes on yes. two items. Cog is going to be online early in this match. And backline access is usually the way you deal with a Cogma. And there's not necessarily the most here. Yes, in a skirmish, Elise can get in there. The perfect Nar flank, yes. But it's not necessarily the prototypical kind of Malphite draft that makes Cogma irrelevant at times. Oh. And a Yasuo oh, wow. being locked in as well. So this is probably Yasuo top for the Shy to go up against Nar. But we don't know for sure where all of this stuff is going. That's a historic matchup where the ability to interrupt the boomerang, have it fizzle out, and no cooldown for Nar means that you can actually drop harass there. It's not necessarily dominant in the early game, but it scales uber well. Final okay. pick here. <laughs> okay. So if they if they can find the matchup, Poppy into Yasuo, and then Nar can play some other lane based on where he goes. Poppy I think they're mid? assuming Probably it's Yasuo mid. mid, just to play Yasuo mid, just to play Yasuo Gragas, and just give the Shy the Kiana. Regardless of matchup, this is going to be fun. So Poppy mid has been a thing in Korean solo queue for a long time. Yeah. In, as an answer to certain picks, it does quite a lot of burst damage as well. There's a lot of walls that you can use your heroic charge into. It's usually a very pocket counter pick, but we're into quarters, and look at this craziness! <laughs> You've got a very melee heavy team with a Yumi to back it up. Griffin have some engage tools. They've got a lot of melee auto attacks in there. The swaps are done. All right. Yeah, watching Griffin try and find fights into Gragas, Lulu, Kiana, all these CCs is going to be fascinating to watch. And now if you add in the Poppy, he can, she can, sorry, really dive into the back line with a yeah. Yumi. So they've got a lot of different angles they can try to attack. And usually Cogmore wants to see all of his threats in front of him and safely disengage. Well, a new champion added to the roster, the Kogma in the bottom lane. Meanwhile, Nar Poppy solos are in for Griffin. I am already excited for a quarterfinals, gentlemen. This is exciting. Welcome to Summoner's Rift for game one of the quarterfinals. Invictus Gaming are defending their world championship against one of the best teams this tournament has ever seen. Griffin, the number two seed from Korea, played so well to get the top seed here. They drew IG, and most people expect Korea wins this one. And with that top seed, they chose the red side and have definitely gone down the counterpicking rabbit hole, but, <laughs> and there is a but here, is that to get the counter picks in the lane matchups they want, they have sacrificed traditional damage. When you think of what a mid to late game team fight looks like, we got Poppy in the mid lane, Nar is very unreliable for damage. Honestly, Yumi might be the highest damage dealer here by a lot, and then no one else really trailing her. So because of that, it feels like early to mid game execution, which was on point from Griffin a few days ago, is what we're gonna have to be really closely inspecting. I think so, and also when we're looking across counter picks, there's a lot of very interesting stuff happening. So I feel like the general team comp by Griffin counters Kiana because there's not a good target for Kiana to actually find any type of assassination on. Normally, it's get your lethality items, go to hit a squishy target. Those squishy targets actually don't exist. Yumi's untargetable, and Elise can also dodge things with repel. So there should be no one that Rookie can find assassinations on. But on the flip side, 
you have a bunch of people with high max health that Kog'Maw with lethal tempo will be able to shred through throughout the game. So hitting the proper timing windows is going to be very important. And while this shouldn't be no surprise when Kog'Maw is in the game, it really is. Does Griffin trivialize Kog'Maw's teamfight impact at the start of a fight? Or does Kog'Maw move back from a lot of melee champions and just kite out and do big damage and decide it? Because if Kog'Maw is not dealt with, then I think IG wins 100% of fights. No, right now, early push into the bottom lane. We're looking at the mid laners. Fight over some farm as Rookie so far doing pretty well on CS. Might have to drop some of the cast minions onto the turret, but so far so good over there. Ning got a pretty heavy leash on the blue buff there. Did the full left side clear, making his way down to the bottom jungle, at least doing very similar things from the north jungle. Looking at the map here already, some vision missions done by Griffin to open things up. Top side start by Elise, not necessarily always standard here, but seems like she's anticipating some bot side shenanigans very shortly. Yeah, you want to make sure that the Garen Yumi can't get punished super early on into the game, since, yeah, they are just going to be pushed in early. Be interested to see if Ning tries to do anything mid. It's actually going to be very difficult to gank Chovy. He has no reason to ever use his W preemptively and can just really wait for Gragas to go in, and then if they ever try and get an initiation, he can just proc his Aftershock that way and become very tanky. So Chovy should be fairly comfortable pushing up in lane here. The one small thing I've seen is he has been using it a little bit for damage. I saw under turret, Rookie jumped in, got granted, so there is some degree of trading going on pretty actively there. And now as the bottom scuttle comes over to Ning, we're not going to have much aggression down here on the bottom side. I want to also talk about the Elise combos that Griffin have run. Elise Renekton is one they've been running since the start of the tournament. I think there's a lot of Elise Renekton in this Elise Poppy duo that we're going to mm. see in the mid lane very much for the stun hits, if you stand next to a wall, if Elise hits a cocoon, the follow-up is insane, and Poppy does have a lot of base burst damage if she's landing her full rotation, so I think they're trying to ape that and potentially roam with it, too. All right, Ward spots out the first gank of the quarterfinals. The Shire running away, has to respect Tarzan, but if Wind Wall's up, you're not going to cocoon that, so simply walks backwards. Should have seen the mid laner come in as well, so they're aware of that timing. And he could go back into the lane as he, I believe Chovy was recalling on the ward. Yeah, and there's going to be a question of where does Tarzan actually put his time early game because he doesn't have anything up on the map reasonably right now to do. His Krugs will be up shortly, so until then, he's actually just going to kind of hang up, hang out up here, and it's interesting how he actually misses the sweep, even though it was fairly obvious they walked over a ward. We're throwing up some stats here from that four games that Griffin played last week on the second round, Robin. The kill-death ratio on the right side is so impressive, a 7.3 kills for every death incurred. I went and looked at stats and I actually asked, has there ever been a better day of best of one play than what we saw from Griffin earlier this tournament? And the answer was actually no. It was probably the most impressive statistical and eye test day of games we've seen from one team. Yeah, and you can even see their group stage kill death. This is Worlds all time. Griffin would be ranked third. If you notice, the two teams above them did end up winning a world championship. So kill death ratio is by no means the be all end all of who will win worlds, but Griffin's group stage in context was very impressive. Now TP back to the top side. Tarzan has continued to stay up here as the Raptor camp has come back up. Hoping to find something on the Shy, who's been playing fairly aggressively. Built a very large CS lead on the Oswell. That's the counter pick we're looking for. Mm. But still no gank to be had, and as the camps come up, the Elise has to get the farm on. A lot of containment done by Griffin so far, but the game really does pivot when Boots and Mobility are done. There was no snowball kill into Boots and Mobility rush from Rookie, but we know that's very likely on the way. If they can keep river control on both sides here, then we won't see a return to form of Rookie, who was really dominating the side lanes against TL so effortlessly on Piano. And I also have to say that the bottom lane of Garen Yumi isn't necessarily expected to win early. They're expected to then turn on kind of once Yumi gets towards Luden. So this early game is going to be about Griffin stopping the bleeding as much as possible. And they're not necessarily doing that very well in the top lane. And it'll be very fun to track how powerful Jackie Love gets in what is essentially a fairly easy lane for him. Important ward down there spotting Ning once again. Chovy using Steadfast Presence to continue the trades with Rookie. Grounds him, turns on Aftershock, makes that all happen. But a couple times we've come to this lane and seeing those abilities used in the one-on-one. -on -one. That means you can't stop the body slam flash anymore. So it's certainly an important cooldown to track. And as Ning gets closer to six, and he's been farming well, right? He's already got more than 10 camps done. Ning with that ultimate can certainly try to force a kill. Seeing the trades continue here. Infernal first spawn, but the double control ward bot side does stop any early infernal start from Griffin. 
They are a team that, while being very tanky, probably do scale pretty decently with mm -hmm. Infernal Drake. And obviously, as a team that has a pretty low damage profile later, you want any sort of snowball you can get. But right now, so far, the setup not there. And if we think about the overall pace of this game, even though there's a 500 goal lead for IG, I would say this is much more of a Griffin-style game than an IG-style game. In terms of deaths, every split Griffin has played in the LCK, they've had the fewest deaths in the LCK. They are a low-error League of Legends team. Invictus Gaming, despite making it to Worlds, had the most deaths in the LPL Summer Split. They are a very high error team <laughs> that is willing to take risks and oftentimes will outplay you through more good plays that overpower the bad. So Papa Smithy and I had this conversation earlier this week. What would like the combined kills per minute breakpoint need to be for IG to win versus for Griffin to win? And we think it ends up having to be very high just because of the way Griffin is used to playing. So this is very much a Griffin-paced game, which despite the goal lead, at least early on, makes you think they're in a decent position. But there's a fun extra wrinkle to that in that IG, we've already noted, as Tarzan doesn't hit the cocoon on screen there, is that we do feel like IG's multiple damage dealers mm -hmm. maybe does give them something resembling a kind of scaling advantage as the game goes on. It's not as one-to-one -one as that, yeah. but... We already saw Griffin be played against their tendencies with G2 scaling draft on the first day of Worlds, going for the Ornn and going for a lot of late game scaling. In this sort of a game, we can't just give the pass mark based on historic performance with kind of low kill games. We do have to look at IG and say, okay, you pack a lot of punch. And I think the Kog'Maw is the big thing that kind of throws a wrench into all of these projections. If he is able to stick strong in team fights as all these melee champions just kind of run at him, it's going to be probably what decides the game, is how well can Griffin find access to Jackie Love? Because from what I've seen, Garen Yumi scales incredibly well, but it also hasn't played into a Kog'Maw before. Yeah, I think that's going to be a very big thing. What we're seeing also is the third play of the game going over to Invictus. We've already seen the bot lane take two. You're seeing a 27 CS lead for the Kog'Maw. The Shy, by the way, didn't burn his TP when he went back to lane a while ago after his first recall. So the tools are here for IG to force a big fight, maybe around this early Infernal. That gives you some of that extra scaling advantage, by the way, if you really want it. But as we see, the TP is finally used. They finally cash that in as he goes into the top lane. And now Chovy is here on a rope. Watching the player come together here. Tarzan lying in wait. These are the sort of areas where Tarzan was able to outpath against G2 and those couple of victories in a row. Petrovi quickly returns to mid lane. Topside advantage is a little bit bigger than I anticipated pre one item. I feel mm -hmm. like after the base stats nerf yeah. years ago, Yasuo doesn't crush Nar in the 1v1 like he once did, but it does scale to be a very strong matchup. Should only get better as it goes on. And I think a lot of that is just, oh yeah, it's the shot. Because he's going to be able to have large CS advantage against basically everyone that he plays against. On the flip side, with the full upgrade on Viper's support item, the gold generation is actually going to start catching up in aggregate. With some mobility actually matched by Chovy, so it seems like he wants to be the same sort of roaming threat that Kiana can threaten to be. CC wise, definitely able to sure. ape what Kiana does with the burst damage. Not usually there as the game continues to roll on. Right now, honestly, a bit of a Galio type here, just really trying to keep Rookie accountable for CS and Roams where possible. All right, well, again, looking at the attempted trades down there. Jumps away, Rookie doesn't want to take that trade anymore. Chovy seems to be kind of putting his presence on the lane at this point. Rookie had a very early CS lead. That's turned back around. The Shy rushing Static Shiv has even more lane pressure, freeing him up to make more of these moves around the map. Spotted all by a control. We're not going to find a fight onto Chovy, but they can push in the mid lane. And I want to take a moment to appreciate how high these CS numbers are. We're 11 minutes in, and all three IG carries are at 10 CS per minute. And then Chovy is actually above it as mid lane Poppy. So Sword and Viper, I feel, are actually closer to average lane CS, and everyone else in the game is actually exceeding it. We sound like boomers a bit there, because 85 at 11 minutes is a little bit behind, but I tend to agree with you, right? Especially in a lot of IG games where you do see higher action, you see more CS denial coming through. These are very high numbers. Let's we'll see if those numbers are abated for a moment. Rookie and IG seem aware about the Infernal being started by Griffin. And even though it's in Fog of War, IG looking around, but Rookie's at half HP, and they don't really have sight onto how low it's getting. It's getting too low, and they finally find some room in the bottom lane, instantly turn it around, Infernal Drake picked up. Ejected IG players and Griffin get the first objective of the game. And even thinking about how 
the group stage went, oftentimes IG was a collection of individuals who overall won the game through their individual achievements. And we kind of see that with the Infernal Drake. You have the lane pressure the whole early game, and you can't get the Infernal Drake. And finally, they're going bot. And the flash of chase through. He's rooted in place, still has plenty of damage output there, but he's running down in first blood. Comes through to Viper's Garen, and now the pile driver to the bottom lane. Bow line's getting low. The Polymorph not gonna do anything. It's two for zero in the bottom lane. The wave clear comes through, and Griffin strikes first. A very exquisite reflection of that team versus individual identity. The moment the Viper went in, you saw there was perfect synergy with Sword coming down as well. The Shy teleported. We saw him teleport to top earlier. Yeah. So he had no ability to match. They're just using a very standard advantage. TP advantage top leads to two kills for the side of Griffin. And at least in that engagement, it looked almost trivial for Viper to be able to get access to the Kogma with the Yumi. Not a very mobile AD carry. And if the Lulu Wall Shield doesn't allow him to actually just outduel the Garen, he's going to lose that one. And it's the difference in lane states when it's a 2v2 normal laning phase and five people A ramming in mid. So obviously in that case, Kogma can be really far back. Looking to trade, looking to CS. Moment that you have that cleanse of CC available on that slow cleanse on Garen. Engage comes in, nicely done by Griffin. Yeah, I want to point out actually a very poor ultimate by Ning there. Probably had the ability to knock Chovy into turret and secure at least one kill back, but IG will remain killless as we see the lane swap come through already from Griffin. It still feels like a two on two that I like from Invictus Gaming. The Blade of the Rune King for Jackie Love was up and ready when that last fight happened, still couldn't kite away. Still, of course, has that item moving in towards the boots upgrades and might still try to farm some plates. I want to point out that even despite those kills picked up by Griffin, more than a thousand gold yeah. there, the gold is still equal slash IG favored from 30 to 50 CS from lanes and the plates taken earlier. So you start asking the question, okay, if this is a Griffin victory from this point, what does it look like? Because again, I feel like if we're grouping as five and staring each other down, not getting to the Kog'Maw. Going to be really tricky and that will... Absolutely. Faven Ning is going in. They're going to find the cast backwards, but Garen is very, very tanky. Slows down. Doesn't seem to matter, though. Roots up the squad. Still walking backwards. He just refuses to die. Garen, invincible in a 2v4. <laughs> and he only gets tankier from the rest of the game. He's going to be able to sustain up a lot as they're now trying to bring a fight back with Gragas and Kiana ultimate down. And we get the confirmation that also trying to pick Garen. Not going to be a way the yeah. game moves forward. The way I think Griffin closes this is getting control vision as Balan already falls low and forcing face checks. That's where Poppy, Elise, Yumi can get picks across the map. Fight down here. Down. Yeah, still battling across this map is the Shy putting some damage on his trophy, but right, stacking armor is Poppy with both those soulings doing that kind of damage is not doing a whole lot. And the Shy is the other hyperscaler that IG can try and use to win this game while IG has been trying to make all these plays. The Shy is just filling himself with minion gold and is kind of, I feel like, trying to rush towards an Infinity Edge so he would also be someone who can slice through. And honestly, you'll probably feel like the strongest champion in mid-game fights is going to be Chovy. It's against three AD damage dealers and stacking armor on Poppy always super high in terms of ability. But the Rift Herald down to 4,000 health here. Well, it's still down on IG, so it's hard for them to force a good fight. It's going to be good damage to the Viper. They're going to have to jump back to the pit, but now without the silence, it's going to make it much more difficult. The Shy walks up, puts down the wind wall, takes the Ignite, gets ulted, and looking for the engage. Good smite, good claim by Tarzan. Is there still to be a fight to be had? No, the Polymorph in. Big damage. Trying to book down Meganar, but he can still flash in. And a nice Zonius buys some space. Tarzan drops down. Sword should lose his life as well, as they're not killing the Kogma. It's a complete wipe. Poor Lehens has nowhere to go. And that's one life down, an ace for IG. And IG just destroy Griffin in that fight. Griffin take so long to kill the Rift Herald. They just let the Kogma and the Yasuo warm up. And the triple kill for Kogma is the perfect thing as IG break this game open. Exactly. It feels like we saw the game-breaking moment. Griffin had so many things in their mind. Clearly wanted to pick up the Rift Herald, but they weren't respecting the chance for a collapse to actually be successful. And when Sword's Mega Narbar actually he doesn't end up being the thing that zones away the enemy. Mm -hmm. They've taken too much incidental damage before the engage can happen. By the time the fight starts, Chovy's at 15% health. So Griffin actually needed to bail as much as they could, but they had no way out other than trying to fight through. Really just actually IG's patience that ends up paying dividends in this fight.
I feel like Sword Zolt was also pretty crap right there. Aims pretty much straight up, pushes the yeah. Magma to relative safety. Again, this team is basically all melee. Only the Nar could follow through. Garen had to peel back and fight the Shy instead. And so 2,500 damage, highest in the fight, goes to the Cog. That was scooped to safety. And it only gets better for IG. Infernal Drake is up, sort of top lane without teleport. It feels like that one fight has kind of broken Griffin's map play, at least temporarily. They've decided they're unwilling to 5v5, which is probably the right call based on the power spikes IG just hit. But that plays into some of our analysis about how Griffin's comp plays. From ahead, controlling space, having to come to them, absolute terror for IG to deal with. But when they don't control maps, when they're often going to be behind in terms of vision control, they're a fiercely melee team with low damage at best. Well, they're going to try to find their comeback somewhere, but already the game seems like it's flipped a 3,000 gold lead in the Infernal's Tide. As another turret falls, it's closer and closer to 4,000. As IG can already look at the fact that they've got two completed items of the Kog'Ma. This is wow. this is Kog online. This is yeah. Blade of the Rune King Rageblade. He's going to destroy everything. Look at the scale here. It's about 3,500, 3,800 gold. All in that play around the five kills, and so much of it going on to the Kog'Ma. It almost yeah. feels like IG should should just win the game from this point on, is yep. what you would think. And it would be on Griffin to need to split them up, find exactly the right team fights and get picks. Otherwise, IG has the gold in the right places. Honestly, it feels like Griffin have to get Baron control and find a way to kill it, even though they have very low Baron speed here. Yeah. That's the objective that brings you back into a game. And that's a two-part plan where before, they kind of controlled wherever they roamed to first. Now we've already seen them seed an Infernal Drake and some of the queries about whether they can make an objective play happen, it'll at minimum take a long time, and we already saw that can be turned around by IG. Well, we've mentioned power spikes a few times. I want to point out a very smart item out of Viper here with the adaptive helm coming mm -hmm. through. Jackie Love is nothing but... Okay, not nothing, but but largely on hit magic damage, repeated magic damage, which he will uh, deny quite a lot of, so at least that's valuable here. And if you can still catch that back lane, if you get a really good Flash Cocoon, there's not a good way out. Jackie Love's got Flash not cleansed. There's no mm -hmm. QSS. There's no Mikhail's on his squad right now. Maybe that comes in at some point soon as Bowland adds a couple of Fairy Charms to maybe push towards that. Yeah, Bowland should be building the Mikhail's next. Otherwise, I'll be very disappointed yeah. in the item choices based on kind of the ways that Griffin can win this game. It's all about if they can catch out Jackie Love in a fight. We're probably not at the tipping point yet where damage items outweigh kind of the early tankiness that Griffin have been able to pick up and how their champions interact with the stats they picked up. So there still is that perfect setup from Griffin, but like we've alluded to multiple times, it needs to be dealing with Jackie Love, forcing him to flash out or just put out no DPS in a fight. Right now it's just standard laning uh, phases of the game as we see everyone returning here. The Baron about to respawn though, or at least spawn for the first time, and that will be the focal point of this game. And towards the top they go. Can they find Sword? The answer is no. They're going to turn back around and let that one just go back towards this tier 2 turret. But Baron is spawned on the map. The range advantage clearly does go to Invictus Gaming. And actually, they found the engage anyway. It was just Rookie who snuck up, finds his stun, and now an engage in the top river. And they will shut down the Kog'Ma. They take down the jungler as well. And Griffin find the two for one fight. And that could have been a very good play for IG. But when you send both your solo laners up to top lane, you should not be contesting River with the rest of your team. So Griffin are able to find the comeback and actually win out on that trade. That exposed underbelly being taken advantage of is exactly why people were skeptical of IG picking up the win here. They do make those fundamental errors where they lose out to a TP advantage on a top lane, or they allow themselves to be collapsed when they're just straight up getting a one for zero in the top side. We're going to see the full rate play. This is the top side play where Rookie did not have to walk through vision for the first time this game. And the burst is pretty insane, let's be real. But it's this other side where Viper's flash is enough to close the distance on the top one. Yeah, Cocoon landed at the start by Tarzan, and that makes the close fairly easy. Griffin will need more fights almost exactly like that if they want to look to come back in this game. All right, so next up, Bowland picks up. Forbidden Idol adds some more shielding power there, and we'll continue to wait to see what finally that comes through into. 3,000 gold difference still in Victus Gaming, the ones who are richer here, but you are seeing what these picks can look like. Yeah, and speaking of money, uh, look at the Shy CS right yeah. now. Yeah. 240 to 21. My minutes. eyes went to the same place. Yeah, the top lane average for CS at 20 for top laners this tournament was 166. 
the shy was at least 50 over the tournament average in this game, and he's not slowing down anytime soon. It's a matchup that only gets better with levels for the Yasuo, and he's close to Flame Horizoning at 22 minutes. So that lets you know the side lane around the TP Nar is not going to be a win condition for Griffin. How they can actually stop that just being another reason that IG have mid game supremacy. Roams like this would go a long way. Toby smashes up. They might just go for him. At a potential slow towards Jackie Love is the team going to go forward. Viper burns the Q. W's to go oh. backwards. You can see, though, that health bar gets burned down, and now it might be time for Ding to walk in. Pulls Predator. Decides to only kill a ward now instead. Yeah. Looking again at the pokes. They're going to find a little bit. Ballet does take pretty good damage there. Keep in mind, that is a pretty scary Lulu who is now finally building towards Ludens. And Griffin is kind of on the wrong side of the map right here. The 22-minute Ocean Drake isn't that valuable. I would say Baron control would be much more important. Not to mention the Shy is still getting bottom lane pressure. So while Griffin looked for that play, they actually lost a decent amount of wave tempo as they now try and move to get Baron control. And a very small thing that came from the five kills earlier, we were focused on how much gold Cogmore picked up, is that all five stacks of Ingenious Hunter went to Gragas, and he's actually just using Predator just to pull people out of the fog, work out where Poppy is, because you have to respond to the Predator pop coming out. So it's actually getting a lot of value there, that CDR on the Predator. It's actually off cooldown again already. The shot grabs the Ocean Drake. Not the most meaningful this later on in the game, but it does have some use when you're considering that uh, Yumi Poke is one of the primary tools that Griffin has to get around the map. Once the fight starts, of course, that turns off. The shot's got to run away. He's in a 1v3. Gets the Q out, not the wind wall. It's going to be rough to try to get away. Doesn't have a good way out. Gets shut down, and Griffin get a kill to get a bit of map control. Important second point that they knew that Cogmo was on a reset, so there was no Baron potential sending three members to kill the Yasuo. Big amount of shutdown, experience, and also map reset now granted to Griffin. And that's the other side of the Shy. You don't get 270 CS at 22 minutes without being a little bit greedy and taking some rather large risks. So at that point, yes, the team was on a reset. Yes, he should have gone back. That's the correct League of Legends play. But he wanted to greed for the blue buff, and he gets caught out for it. And it costs IG a lot. He loses the wave pressure. More gold goes on the sword. He's able to get solo turret gold. He's more likely to be able to match Nar. And the actual game is now within one and a half K. Yeah, overall about a thousand gold went back to Griffin off of that. We'll see what they can do in terms of map setup here, because already some spotting control wards around the red side jungle, and for once, Nar being able to push the minions into in a bot lane turret. Usually that again means that you can start making Baron plays, but we talk about this often. Uh, there's very little Baron threat coming from the side of Griffin, so as I do, you can take those extra half seconds to talk to your team and really get the comms straight, because you don't respect a rush of Baron by Griffin, really at all. Might not be a rush of Baron. I know we talked about the kills people coming in. It's going to be the redemption, though, through for Bowland. Instead, Jackie Love stops to pick up QSS, QSS, then pushes forward on damage items. I agree with you, Jad. I would yeah. like the greedier Kog'Maw build, rely on the Lulu for that, but it's just the way they played it. The the whole game, I feel like, could potentially pivot on whether oh, or not Jackie right can now. They're for the root, pops QSS, runs backwards, but he's still silenced. Flashes the wave, but Swords right on top of him, and again, Jackie Love goes down. He is unable to fight, and it's time for Griffin to push through. They've knocked back Rook. Looks like they're going to disengage, just take the single kill. That's three in a row. The Griffin find a single kill and walk back. And that's what they can do when they have summoners up and they're able to gap close in multiple different ways. We la laid it out clearly. Jackie Love goes down. IG definitely have to reset and wait for him. How much can Griffin Narl's up, Narl's up. They find the stun. They're going to knock down Rookie. Had to face check the brush. And Griffin continue to find more kills. Chovy finds almost a stun in the Shy as well. Sword wants in for the slow. Will be disengaged finally. And their team play has been so good. They still have Flash on Garen for the next time Jackie Love comes up. So I think they're going to try and repeat these pick plays around Baron. Remember, their Baron is very slow. So it's going to be difficult for them to actually take it. Therefore, they're going to try and get picks off of vision plays. Everything for Griffin after the five deaths around Rift Herald is difficult, and yet they're executing their decisions and how decisive they are uh, is what is keeping them here, because otherwise, the Shy Slamming Sword and 5v5s are looking tricky getting towards a Cogmore who has a lot of mobility provided by the Lulu, and yet, so far, they're staying in this game, and IG's fundamental small mistakes that we've seen in groups mm -hmm. that we saw in the LPL are holding them back from actually shutting the door on Griffin. Little column A, little column B, some mistakes made by IG, and props to Griffin for finding the openings. Cannot quite knock back Viper, walked up for the ward, turned around in time. Thornmail actually is yep. the first armor item done, and again, makes a lot of sense. Half a Cogmore damage, and Kiana and Yasuo 
needs no explanation there. So they've got a face checker for sure. Your control wards don't last long against Griffin because eventually Garen walks up and deletes them. Speaking of deletion, we get the replay. Yeah, and this was a small 20% slow onto Jackie Love into just a Yumi all in. So yes, they root, they silence, you can QSS flash, but you're just going into yet another engager. The key there was actually sword flanking around the side and being able to find access. And then when it comes to this dark map, how long can you wait? Rookie Diddley, this is about yep. 15 seconds, right? So they could be on Baron here. Unfortunately, they're not when it comes to Rookie's perspective and he goes down. Yeah, and there was a very small window to pull that off because Rookie was about to go invisible. That's why he jumped in to grab the grass blade and was planning on queuing immediately. So if the immediate stun didn't come through from Griffin, there's a chance that Rookie actually gets away from that. Yeah, but still spotted out, taken down. And we can again look at the map state, a 900 gold difference. IG still in a small lead. Still also up that one ocean, Drake, but a tight game here. Zeal done for the Kog'Ma. I am perennially on Kog'Ma. Watch a yep. Last Whisper in for Rookie. A Sterex Gage plus the 30 edge done for the Shy. So I do want to point out that it's not always just Kog'Ma, right? The other champions matter a lot as well of mm -hmm. the IG carries. They do have plenty of damage output there. The question is, can they withstand all the picks that Griffin are putting out? Yeah, how long does it take for Griffin to kill Kog? And how much time does that buy the Shy? to really do a bunch of damage in the fight because there are two hyper carries that IG have in their roster. But when we do see the usual setups of five champions in mid, the only person you can grog as cast is the Yasuo, right? As backline. Oh, they, oh, they rookie. found a catch, they rookie! Him. Over the wall onto a ward, just goes down right away, and it means that's in front of control yet again to Griffin. IG just needed a team fight, and Rookie hands it away. Yeah, rookie setups against TL really got them into the quarterfinals, but it's set up there. Well caught by the side of Griffins. To my point, though, they need to find a way to actually use their Gragas Yasuo to threaten because so far, Gragas doesn't want to ult Yasuo. Sorry, Gragas doesn't want to ult Garen because he's the only person he gets access to. And then Kogmo is killed. It's really about Ning finding a three, four man cast in a fight and getting the most out of the Shy as the gold lead is definitely coming down. Look at that comeback from Griffin. After there are a bunch of melee champions into a Kogmo. They have not allowed IG any favorable fight. They gave them the most favorable fight at Rift Herald, but being able to bounce back from that makes this a very competitive game. It's best of five, starting out strong, can really help you kind of start forcing the pick and ban around, say, ah, you know, we can't beat Garen, or we can beat Garen. You can start making things really awkward there as the yeah. blue goes over to rookie pretty easily. And this Garen Yumi strategy isn't something that will make or break the series, but I can understand why Griffin wanted to throw it out in game one, because you gain such a pick ban advantage if you're actually able to come back in a game like this where, okay, IG had the counter. They proved it doesn't work. It would just limit their ability to ban for the rest of the series. And while pick ban advantage is one thing, think of the mental edge they get when you know that IG were probably prematurely feeling super confident after getting their five kills and coming back here. So edging out this game, coming from behind when so much in the side lane, and honestly the 5v5 scene set up for IG has to be both a mental and drafting advantage to Griffin. Well, item still coming through. Pretty close to Dead Man's Plate now on the Viper. She needs the uh, combine for that one. The second Adaptive Helm through onto the Poppy as well. The components right now on top of Sword. So it's a good mix of armor and magic. This one all the squad. And that is kind of the damage type here of IG. Cog tends to be about 50 50. And obviously, Kiana and Yasuo, very physical, heavy. Gragas, you notice he did not go for the flat pin build. I think that's very, very smart. He's not going towards the Oblivion Orb because he knows his targets are all tanked with high magic resist. So often we see players buy the wrong items. This one, I want to get yep. a high five to Ning for not doing a flat pin build in this game. Completely agree with you. It's about IG finding the right type of target access. It's, it's difficult because it is a bunch of tanks that they're going to have to be fighting against. So a lot of it is just extending the fight, properly kiting okay. back. Or can they actually just burst down this bear? And they have a lot of damage. Looking at the setup now, trying to rush this one down. Viper coming around the wings. Jack of Shields off the first rookie. one. And there's Rookie looking for a big stun. Yasuo on top! And they're going to have Zor pop the Zonias. They've knocked down one, but it's only the Kragas. That's Ooh. a big ult from Sword. Is the re-engage enough? Rookie's off in the wings, but Kagma refuses to die. He's on four. Looks for Chovy. It's stolen away. Rookie denies the Penta. But Baron, you have to believe goes to Invictus Gaming. And starting off that Baron allowed them to finally get the start they were looking for. Rookie not caught out this time. His start actually ended with a plum by Jackie Lowe. And that fight was just decision overload for Griffin. 
Look at the Baron. We have to stop the Baron. Wait! Here's Rookie. And even though the start of the fight seemed like Griffin was able to turn it around early, the fact that they used so much of their burst on a Kiana who had already used the cooldowns meant they had nothing left for the decisive kill they needed on Kogma. So yes, Yumi repels the first engage. Windwall stops Tarzan. They burst the Kiana. And now Jackie gets to fire. The damage, it stopped. They don't have enough damage left. And you can see, even though he gets very low, that's all the time it takes for the Kog'Maw to clean. And the magic trick of the IG comp is create enough ruckus for Jackie Love to kill everyone on Hurricane Rage Blade. Now, and speaking of, the picks might get to start the ult into the Oswell. Of course, again, those are tanky, tanky champions. Don't quite get to go down. But you're seeing now IG ready for the push. Ult comes in. They're going to find Jackie oh, Love. No. He's going to drop yet again. Griffin just jump oh! right in. Look at the ulti in from Sword. And they are spinning to win all over the top of IG. A couple of kills Shy. come back. The Shy tries to run. Don't know if he can take this one. He cannot. But Rookie's here. And Bowlands right behind him. It's overall three deaths on IG. Only two down on Griffin. And IG is teamwork away from being unbeatable because their individual mechanics are so good, but then they face check four people down mid lane while Rookie is prepping a side wave and get immediately engaged on. And that's the amazing thing is it's what we built up. It really does feel like the unstoppable force versus the immovable object because at the end of the day, for all IG do right and the game breaking moves they make, they keep not having the fundamentals to close it out in a timely fashion. Here comes a flank from Rookie. TP and coming a TP. in as well. It's a Yasuo. Go over the big play. They're going to find that stun. But do they have the damage to kill a Garen? With Kogma, they probably do. But uh -oh. here come oh, the it was a Kogma. Suddenly they are on top Go of them. And yet again, Jackie Love doing so much true damage in this game, but not enough to kill the champion. I completely missed it. Yasuo is dead. It was a Kogma flank. You can't do that in a situation like this. The flanking Cogmore is not the deadliest. That's a new one. That is definitely not what you're looking for here. And Jackie Love has been known to make those mistakes on occasion. Not recently. A wonderful year for him. But now, suddenly, IG have a lot of it to do all over again, even though they've broken open this game twice in clear fashion. We take a bit of a breather here. We've got a minute left on Baron, but it feels like IG is not going to get to use that very much, waiting for Jackie Love to respawn. Big fight in the mid lane, doesn't turn into a kill right away, but the re-engage so good from Griffin. Yeah, the big thing you have to note is that Kiana was just bottom lane clearing out a wave, so Griffin know he's not that close. And they say, okay, Jackie Love, you stepped up. We know you have no flash. We're just going to kill you. And they do that. And then even after that happens, look at how much damage the Shy is able to pump out. Stop watching at about 200 health. He actually nearly kills Lahans as well after that fight is over, but eventually they chase him down. It's all about the timing there. And we saw this play and we knew that Yasuo had perished, so we thought, assumed it's gonna be Yasuo in the back line. No, it's a Kog'Maw who thinks that he has a flank angle. Nope, oh. final chapter's back up. They're able to deal with him and suddenly, somehow, we're basically all even again at 35 minutes. And you feel like the scaling has to be in the favor of IG. If Jackie Love can just sit and fire, he's a late enough game Kog'Maw that he'll be able to shred. But we just don't know if that situation is going to arise. He's still flashless. His scimitar is up, which will give him some mobility. Bowland does have his wild growth at this point. So it's a lot of extra health they can pump into him. But we just don't know what's going to happen next. Red buff, I think, is actually a really huge deal here with the Hurricane. Love Hurricane against melee heavy compositions. Jackie Love going to try for something as they find the slows back and forth. Viper pushed a bit back. Sword charging up, though. Meganar is imminent here. That is a cooldown, a state that IG must respect. We can see we're two minutes away from Baron respawning here, and I wouldn't be surprised if IG just stayed on this screen for the next mm -hmm. 100 seconds or so. If they can keep eyes on all of Griffin, and avoid a flank, then Jackie will be very happy. Because if he can actually flash backwards to continue DPS, with that flash not taking him into yet another threat, that's how IG win. So we have to say, viewers, where is that likely to happen? The Baron is where it happened the last time where they could actually make it about what they wanted rather than respecting every flank angle that Griffin was coming on. Baron himself spawns in a minute 15. I imagine that is IG's conventional way to find a game-breaking lead. And we had a lot of discussions before the series about how this could range from a 3-0 smash for Griffin to a 3-0 smash for IG 
depending on which version of these teams showed up, what I'm really happy about is it feels like this is the best scenario where the evenly matched versions of these teams are facing each other. The strengths are apparent. The weaknesses are as well, and they're just battling it out. And you just want to see them roll through different pick ban strategies, put Viper on a conventional AD carry, and see how that will carry forward, because if the play level stays the same, we're in for a banger of a series. Once again, we go to the mid lane wave clear 30 seconds away from Baron spawning as they push on forward. It's Griffin first to shove this one in. The resets have already come through for IG. No more time to shop. You have to play around this top river right now. And that control where they just got killed by Griffin is the brush they actually need to control. But if you look at their inventories, they only have enough space for one control ward. So it's actually very difficult for them to be able to stop those flank angles. And as you mentioned that, IG walk right back in and reclaim all that territory. Yumiq used for some wave clear. Once again, Griffin can push in mid, but they have to walk, then walk through again all over IG's wards. And our issue now is, now that we're late enough in the game, is how does Griffin actually break the game open themselves rather than mm -hmm. responding to an IG mistake? That is trickier for them as their damage profile gets lower and lower. They want to be able to contest and close the distance, but Jackie Love unlikely to just give over his life in the front line once more. Poke continuing, wave clear continuing. They know from the Dead Scuttle crowd that IG are probably safe at this Baron. Griffin are not trying it. Their overall Baron takes pretty rough. Overall, you could probably blast Cohen in, but that's it. As Rookie runs around to the bottom side of the map, hiding inside this Drake pit. We know that's spawning in 40 seconds. He's looking for maybe a flank play. As Griffin, they can be seen taking down some of the wards. Now the Southern River, some of it belongs to Griffin as well. But Griffin is getting starved out of wards. Even though they have two sight stones, they've used all of their ward charges on both of those sight stones and only have one sweeper left. So they say, we can't play this vision game any longer. Let's go for something. Griffin are actually the ones that start the play. Right, a scuttle despawns. Forward they go. Rookie wants to scout. Can't see it just yet. They see, okay, that's like three Griffin members. That's not enough to stop the Baron. We're safe yet again. Kogma, rank three ultimate, has massive, massive range. Jackie Love can spot check that constantly. Barrel land chunk down, but as long as he stays far enough back, that's going to be okay as well. Continued poke, but it's all in a fog of war. The control ward's not bad for IG. Sword by himself, can't go to Mega. Looking for the engage, they're layering the CC, and Sword this time is caught out. A blunted object of redemption puts health bars up, and IG dare a 4v5 team fight. Damage onto the Baron, waiting to burn that one down. Looking for the re engage. Three crucial ults, sorry, two crucial ults are down. Wait, wait, wait. comes down. At what point Rookie? does the re engage happen? Rookie only has so many tools, and health bars are low. The Baron is smitten. And IG get to walk away with a kill and the Baron. And that is such a long death timer. Griffin is scrambling to try and find the right decision. They move straight to Elder because they know IG has a reset, but they are fast coming out. And remember, Griffin can't kill objectives quickly. So it's still 4v5. Griffin is trying for some miracle. They're looking for a gank rush here. They know okay, they, they can't touch down Jackie Love. They might get Jackie. He's in the front, the stun only hits one there, he flashes back for the safety, this could still be a team for that IG wins, despite the first Maybe two five, kills. Three, four. Here comes Rookie, here comes the wind wall, all on top, and Viper has to flash to get away, same for Tarzan. They might stay him. alive, but the Shy is right over the wall, and gets the shut down all the same. It's still a 3v4 for living members, as Nar just respawns. There's a fight now between Chovy and Rookie. The armor's quite high, the armor Short pen's here. still the same. Still out, never with the damage comes through, flash the way from the boomerang, and Jack Look at absolutely kill Sword here. The Shy pretty much immune to dragon damage as Griffin kite away. The three on three, though, the carries are the ones alive. IG should rest control, but they are afraid of what the re-engage might look like. They're actually going to disengage here, drop the wards, and let the Shy get away. They don't, don't have, have their jungler. Here. Tarzan is the only one with smite. Pokes coming through. He, 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 he Does might. he try? He doesn't even try. Hey, uh, they're not going to. Dragon comes over, and here's the re-engage. They find the stun, and Sword will die as soon as he respawns. Blue buff handed over. IG have such a lead now. Death timers are so long that walking up and getting the Elder and dying for 50 seconds is not something Tarzan calculates as the right move. I actually really oh. like this approach where they try to get a pick rather than slowly rush down the Elder. But Jackie Love having flash up and then Hurricane autos means the Shy and Rookie can fight back on the back end. That backward sidestep by Jackie Love. So the Cocoon gets graciously tanked <laughs> by his jungler Ning is absolutely worth because the fact that IG end up having their three carries up and there's no longer a Garen for the ideal Yumi delivery system means IG can win in the ensuing chaos. 
Yeah, you just feel like the paranoia must be there for the Griffin fans if they lose with this again. Different approach to the game, lower damage, does echo some of the Pantheon Talia games. They lost to SKT mm. in the Spring Final. They've got plenty of games to reset. It's a full best of five, but IG knocking on the Nexus soon. Kobe's ult unable to disengage them, so that's going to be middle inhibitor turret gone. The inhibit itself now under fire. 6,000 gold leads, still a minute left on both Baron and the Elder Dragon buffs. It's going to be very hard to fight this squad. I don't think Griffin should go for a fight here because IG is just gonna try and clean inhibitors. There's a good chance this goes to either the next Baron or the next Elder, but it is an even more secure lead for IG. Recall comes through for Rookie, seemingly, that they don't want to fight for the inhib turret itself, just clear away his last few waves. Now, Jackie Love has no more items to buy. Every slot is full, and there's not a lot I would replace there. So giving him yeah. the farm is a little awkward because Ning has an item and a half to go. Honestly, in the late game, very often damage outstrips tankiness when you try to match it with purchases when you, your gold just can't withstand the sort of damage that can be purchased. So with all these tank items, Viper and the rest of Griffin are still very mortal, and Jackie Love is so strong. If Rookie could find some type of flank, IG would go for the win. What they're probably hoping for is the second inhibitor because Griffin will have such poor wave clear against two waves of supers, IG would potentially never rest control of the game back. Baron buff already gone. Elder Dragon out in three Wall seconds. Down, maybe they go. The region. There's the dive into the front lines. He wants to cast Bison into space. They look for the re-engage. A stun towards Sword. He's very, very low. The Shy staying alive. Here comes the re-engage. Magadar oh! puts them all against the wall. But Jackie Love, that's what you got to care about here. Sword barely staying alive. And Jackie Love on the other side of the fight. They should be able to chase down this Nar. One more open. He's going to run away. Instead, it's the rest of the squad trying to run out. And it's a double kill in for Rookie. Only one dead for IG. IG's just going to push towards the base. There's only two people left for Griffin, I think they win. Minions on the Nexus turrets now as well. Battle entrance buys his base with Tarzan there as that's gonna be the turrets falling down. There's only two surviving members. They cannot stop this push anymore. Tarzan does his best, but he is a squirrel and he's gonna die. And that's the cat gone as well. The wildlife is gone. It's Invictus Gaming and a slobber knocker taking down game one. What a fascinating game between Griffin and IG. We tried to build it up what would it look like which ig which griffin we see the best and worst of all of them and yet we're probably still left jack with even more questions after game one we need to load in and get this series going even further which ig will show up which griffin will show up yeah that's yes. what we got this the answer game. is yes. yes yes they showed up and I can't wait to see what this means for the rest of the series because we know big picture it's a world champion. Those are five world championship yep. players that just beat Garen Yumi to win game one. And yep. this is a Griffin who, as you mentioned, have tried gambits at the start of best of fives before, had them fail, and then it didn't really feel like they had a plan B. So what's Griffin's plan B going to be? Because now, with the Kogma Lulu proving, barely, but proving yes. superior, sure. IG has that edge. They had the answer. I don't know if they had the proof. I think the working maybe gets partial credit. The answer, though, was correct. They yeah. were able to pick up the victory. What it all means, because it's very easy to drop the Garen Yumi and go more conventional, get some more damage out of the mid lane, or is it no? It was the execution, roll it back, and potentially lose a game, too. I mean, there were some interesting execution choices right here. We had a very high death game for Jackie Love, tried to maximize that Kog'Maw passive. That said, 1,183 damage per minute, which I'm not surprised for Hurricane Kog'Maw with a Lulu against four melee, but a banger of a game to be sure. For more on game one, let's head over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you, Freak. Uh, a banger, a slobber knocker. You could keep the adjectives <laughs> coming Was because what, what a game one to kick off our quarterfinals here. Very back and forth between the squads, but it is our defending world champions that come out with the 1-0 in the scoreline. And look, that is not a clean game of League of Legends. I don't think the best of IG or Griffin showed up in that game, and it was so back and forward. And I think that both teams, like, that's not a momentum builder game one. No. You know, backstage, both teams just go, what the heck happened there? <laughs> I don't know. I think if you win that game, you're walking away, you're like, oh, thank God. Well, but that's it, right? It's a thank God. It's yeah. not a, well, now it's in the bag yeah. kind of a feeling. I do want to roll us to Champion Select because we had a lot of preconceived notions about this matchup, play style-wise, and how each of these teams might come to the table. Some came out to chalk and expectations, and some threw us for a loop. Yeah, so I'll start by saying that I thought that Griffin played very well 
with the draft that they have. Like, I actually, it's probably the worst draft that I've seen in memory. Like, I'm scratching real hard, and I just don't see it for them. I mean, one of the things that you can say kind of went somewhat to expectation is is both the way that top lane was drafted and played out, right? Okay. We have Nar as the safe blind pick. He's going to build defensively. He's going double door and Tabby's rush, trying to just survive. Mm -hmm. And you have the Shy going Hail of Blades Yasuo, which is extremely lane focused. It's about the all in. It's about you know the re cooldown reduction from that attack speed on your Steel Tempest, as well as the three quick auto attacks to threaten 100 to zero style of all in. And that's somewhat what allows him to gain this monumental lead. And I think that at the same time, you know, that was well read from Griffin. Mm -hmm. Nott is one of the few champions that has a relatively safe laning phase mm -hmm. and does provide utility as a good laner in the late game throughout the team fight. And I think Griffin, when you look at the other half of the map, they went with roaming mid laner to try and match Rookie, you know, a very tanky composition. And this comp was just all about being able to get on whatever bottom lane marksman that IG played towards and being able to make his life miserable in the early game. And, and this is though kind of where they lost me. I actually was all aboard for, t for the top lane matchup. I yes. was all aboard for the poppy, I think into Kiana Yasuo, that makes a lot of sense, but they didn't draft any sort of consistent damage to actually actually, you know, buy time for, right? You know, what, what are you doing if you're playing weak side of the map in top lane, allowing yourselves to seed lane to this Yasuo? Who's the scaling person who's getting something out of that, right? You have a Garen who's not even going Black Cleaver, pure tank on the bottom side. I think with a standard marksman, if this is Zaya or Kai'Sa or something down there, this would have been great. We're going to try and, and make some sense of, of those picks and the way things played out uh, uh, throughout the game. But first, I do want to take a look at that featured matchup in the top lane. As you mentioned, the picks very much aligned with what we expected. The play as well. The Shy building an enormous CS lead throughout the game on that Yasuo. Just kind of, you know, having his way with Sword in the side lanes. Yeah, and I think that's what we expected in this one. In fact, they even drafted so heavily, like you said for the laning phase to be able to deal with that. So laning phase worked exactly as expected and they had the support topside. Ning went topside, gave him that. Every time they had like, or at least there was two specific moments where they had crashing waves that Nar couldn't really deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, it was more so you need to continue to set that up as the game goes on. So 14, I would say 20 minutes onwards, Yasuo should not be really uh, teleporting or like moving towards the fight unless direly needed. That Nar can't deal with them in the split. The Shy oftentimes roamed out of the lane. You could say the same for Kiana. It was actually just the Shy, or at least IG as a whole, looking for team fights too heavily, and it wasn't shining really well on the Shy. That was the top lane. Now let's go to everywhere else on the map, where some of the things caught us by surprise. When trying to identify where Griffin's win conditions were, I want to take a look at the bot lane dive. This ward here, not spotted out by IG, will be the teleport ward to buy them a double kill. And this was a really nice setup from Griffin, so credit to them, right? They're going for these aggressive moves. They know they have kind of a more mid-early game comp. I mean, this was Moby Boots Poppy as your mid laner, so they were trying to set up for these roams, for these plays on the bot side, to try to get down there, put the Kogma behind, so that Jackie Love would never really be able to come online. But this is the tough spot, because with the composition that they have, they just don't have range, right? Even after getting the double kill, they immediately have to reset, because Greg is in the bot side, so you're not going to get turret plating. They just can't get any significant gold after that, with all the resources they pulled in to get the kill. However, I do want you to think about how the LCK plays, right? Because with that bottom lane advantage, you would expect an LCK team to not challenge for any of the Dragons and not challenge for the Rift Herald, because they've already established themselves that early game. That is not what we saw in this game. When they do go towards the Rift Herald, it's actually going to be IG challenging Griffin again from a deficit. And I think those three kills at the Griffin Rift Herald fight is actually what swung this game back into IG's favor. Any other team in the LCK, in my opinion, does not challenge this. And I'll give, you, I'll give you the credit here, Spawn, because you called this in Countdown. You said a 1K goal lead 10 minutes, a 2K goal lead 10 minutes. IG will still choose to take these fights. No Kiana ultimate. No Lulu ultimate. There is nothing available in this fight for IG to be able to use in their ideal composition. They just burnt it all on Garen Uni top lane, who then walked down to this fight with full health and still somehow IG are able to pick up the uh, team fight victory. There is this really nice like bit here that you saw from Nar walking in. Lulu also like polymorphed him, the ultimate from Yasuo to keep him at bay. So there was a lot of great ideas that IG had to essentially just stop 
uh, Griffin's play. But Raz, you called it. They expected the Shy with his CS lead to be bottom lane still, to be split pushing. Instead, he rotates the play. They expect a Kiana that doesn't have ultimate to not want to fight over yes. that objective. So I think that Griffin really underestimated just how much IG is going to challenge them in this mid game. I don't think you make that mistake twice. I think you check more boxes the next time around. Agreed. From there, of course, we saw a very back and forth game. We saw misplays, mispositions by people on both sides of the coin. Jackie Love multiple times dying <laughs> after Baron's picked up. We saw Sword caught out of position to spell disaster for Griffin. <laughs> and I think that's where we return to this idea that this is not necessarily going to be a huge momentum building game because both teams will come off of stage and say, there are things to work on. So I come to you, Azale, and I say, with IG moving to red side here in game two, for Griffin, what's the answer? Do you just run away from this Garen Yumi back to what you've known? Or does that initial dive give you confidence that you can execute this as long as you're a little bit cleaner? I, I think you can just temper it, right? You can you can do Garen Yumi in the bot side, but put it alongside a Tristana or a Lucian or some sort of marksman. You can do Poppy in the mid lane, but don't put it alongside that Gary and Yumi. We need to see a more well-balanced comp. Well, all three of you spotted IG one game in your Griffin predictions. That's the one, so they're <laughs> going to have to string three back to back to back. IG and Griffin are kicking off the quarterfinals, and here you're watching them through the lens of the Oppo Mobile Cam, designed to make sure you won't miss a moment of Worlds 2019. Now the reigning world champions are 1-0 up, but Griffin are looking to bounce back when we return. Not fair. Not fair. Crittle gives you wings. 